Canon Films may help you? Yes, one moment. One day, and I, I was there in the offices, editing, finishing the editing and the final touches of one merchants. Uh, somebody came to them with an idea, Mike Stone, martial artist. Nobody ever heard about ninjas, but Menachem Golan was clever enough to, to seize the opportunity. He saw something cinematic, something interesting here, and there was a script. Mike Stone was supposedly the star. They had some money, some kind of connection to the Philippines, and they went to Manila and they were shooting the movie. While in Manila, Menachem Golan met Franco Nero, the Italian star. <laughs> The first martial art to sweep the modern world was Jiu-Jitsu, closely followed by the discipline of Karate. Then we were taught to combine the spiritual with the physical by the masters of Kung Fu. And now, the Canon Group is proud to introduce the practitioner of the oldest and ultimate martial art, the Ninja. The company Canon Film just have, have just finished to make a movie which was called Enter the Ninja. Enter the Ninja was with Franco Nero and Shokasugi. Shokasugi was the bad guy, Franco Nero was the good guy. And Menachem Golan directed. The movie had a modest success, so they decided right away to make a sequel, to produce a sequel. And this time to take Shokasugi and make him the good guy, because he was so impressive with his martial art. My story is around you and your son, and, and the father and the wife. Uh, uh, what, uh, Stephen Hayes' part will be a small part of the of a, an organized uh, bad guy, etc. But and I did not sign Stephen yet, but and I, I will discuss I, it you. But but definitely I'm not going with Mike Stone. But do you know what? Action scenes very important. Action scenes. Yes. Okay, Mike does very good choreography. Yes. Also, he can fight with me very good. Yes. And uh, Steve, I have no guarantee I can do. That's amazing. Look, Mike Stone, he thinks his, his head is in the, in the sky, you know? He's not on earth. He wants crazy money, and it is impossible for us to pay the kind, this kind of money. It is impossible. We're not doing big budget movie. Impossible. So if I have to lose you, I will lose you, and I'll be very sorry. The boss, Menachem Golan, did not want to direct this movie. The name of the movie was Revenge of the Ninja. You know, we really wrapped up the One More Chance. Uh, I went with the company, it played in a couple of festivals, so they sent me, I was around the world, in Switzerland, in Cannes, in France, in Chicago. One day, Menachem Golan calls me, because we were already, the movie was over, and we were together in Cannes Film Festival. So the, the company was a little bit expanding, and he got busy, he didn't want to go again to the whatever, far away from the office. So he was looking for a director. He didn't tell me the story with the Emmett, I didn't know. He knew me for many years as assistant director, I was his assistant director also. And uh, I've proven, I proved that I can put together 90 minutes of a story, right? I made the movie One More Chance. There is a beginning, there is a middle, there is an end. Uh, People can watch and uh, sit and watch it. It went to some festival, got some recognition. Not not uh, not big, but, but uh, moderate. Uh, uh, some kind of recognition. People say, you know, even festivals. Okay, he can put together a movie. So when I'm going to say, okay, you please do the movie, uh, but there is a problem. And the problem that this is an action movie. You directed the movie, okay, social drama, but here I'm, I'm entrusting you with action movie. Can you do action? You know, by then I knew that action is not a job for one director. There is a second unit director, there is a stunt coordinator, the camera, you know, cinematographer. Many people are involved anyway. And even more so, they introduced me to Shokasugi, who was the choreographer of the fights anyway. So I said, don't worry. I know how to put together a fight to, on, on the screen. And, and we, I have enough assistance and people and help around me to support me and to carry me through the... To, to this. So they trusted, they, they decided it's okay, and they trusted me and they gave me this script, the script, Revenge of the Ninja. So that's really how I was launched into it, it was just because I was in the corridor, I was around in the company. This is the real reason, you know. 
they did not seek me out of some agency or anything like this. I was available, I was around, they knew me, so it was a matter of fate, of accident that uh, I was here, the company was here, Martial Art Movie was here, and everything, we collided, all of us collided. The Ninja, the perfect assassin. <laughs> the greatest ninja warrior vows to give up killing. My sword is sealed forever. But a ninja cannot escape his destiny. It will follow him from the gardens of Japan to the streets of America. I was introduced, of course, to Shokasugi. Shokasugi introduced me to this world. I did not know anything about martial art whatsoever. I never saw a Hong Kong Kung Fu movie in my life before this. The only knowledge I had about uh, martial art was uh, samurai movies. I loved the uh, Akira Kurosawa samurai movies. I saw every samurai movie that <laughs> existed. I almost, I, I, I exaggerated, there are hundreds of them. But you know, the big ones. So this was my only knowledge about this world of martial art, kind of samurai. The, the world of the samurais in the movies. So Shokasugi took me under his wing. Shokasugi made sure that I would see the best of the best of the martial art movies. I saw them all in Chinese. I didn't understand one word, but, uh, but which was actually good because all he wanted me to really see the fights. Uh, the action, how do you put together fights, not, not the story, but they didn't matter. So he introduced me and then next stage into the world of ninjutsu. We went to, there is a little Tokyo here in downtown Los Angeles. There are stores. We bought one or two books in English about ninjutsu. I read them. Suddenly I realized that everything I saw, which are basically not, not there, they come from China. It's, it's all Chinese. The, the little weapons, all the, the little gadgets, they're mainly Chinese and they somehow cross from China to Japan and uh, through Okinawa. Anyway, that, that's how I, I was introduced to the subject. The writer was uh, Jim Silk, so I was introduced to the writer and we started to work on the movie. This, this was the beginning of uh, Revenge of the Moon. He's caught in a drug war between the American Mafia and the Japanese Yakuza. Are you trying to tell me there's ninjas? running around there killing people in the 20th century. Shokasugi, he's a martial artist, of course, but he had enough sense to understand that if you make a pure martial art movie, it doesn't work for the general audience. When I say general, I mean worldwide, not only martial art enthusiasts. So he had this sense, that's why he came to Hollywood. He left Japan and he came here for this purpose. So he had this sense that you have to make a James Bond martial art. It's not enough to make a Hong Kong martial art movie. You have to make it a general action. You have to make it a James Bondish type of a movie. He had this sense. I came in, I'm not a martial artist. So for him, actually, there is no rivalry here. I'm not, I don't come from the world of martial art and I will tell him what to do and because I don't know what to do. <laughs> I'm just listening to him. So maybe, maybe, or perhaps he figured out, okay, it's a great opportunity. Young director, he's not going to bother me, <laughs> Shokazugi. I will call the shots to everything that has to do with martial art. And if he knows how to put a movie together, that's all we need, <laughs> this guy. And, and so, uh, so now we started to work and I expressed to him the same idea. I'm not interested of ma to make the movies you showed me, Hong Kong movies. I am not interested to make this kind of movie. That's what I'm interested in. I also want to make a James Bond movie. But, and uh, if it so happened that we have to, it had to be within the envelope, within the framework of a martial art movie, let it be. That's okay with me. But still, we are going to make a Hollywood action movie. We are not going to make a Hong Kong or, or a martial art movie. Both of us understood this basic premise that we are making, going to make a Hollywood movie with a martial art flair. And then the relationships were cordial and nice. He, he never respected me from the point of view of a martial artist because I'm not part of his... I don't know anything about martial art. I never lifted my hand or my leg in the air, nothing. So, so he didn't have to even to deal with me on this on this level. He had 
you know, Sho had a group, he's a sensei, he had a, he's a master. He had a group of followers who came with him, worked with him on the movie. Six or eight guys all the time with him. He had uh, Steve Lambert, with it, which is a martial artist also, so they can speak the same language. He didn't need, so I was for them, I was the director and I didn't have to deal with the, mar- the, the side of the martial art of it, so I didn't have to obey by the codes. And this was their relationship, but that's why, that's why it worked. Coming off of Enter the Ninja and then going into Revenge of the Ninja uh, in regards to Sho Kasugi, I, can't, I read, I don't know if I read in the book or if I saw it in a documentary, uh, Sho, Sho Kasugi was talking about having to uh, bring uh, his son, uh, K- his two kids, Kane and Shane, into Menachem Golan's office and, and show them what he can do. I mean, at this point, I think uh, Kane was like probably five and Shane, I think, was around three or something. and. And uh, Kane won, you know, probably over 200 martial art trophies and just really and had him enrolled in a bunch of different disciplines like gymnastics and judo and taekwondo and all these different things. And really, like, um, he was, like, uh, sort of cultivating his own little, like, Von Billion ninja troupe. It's in the line of people like Ernie Reyes Jr., who his dad, Ernie Reyes Sr., did sort of the same kind of thing. And Mark DeCoscos, his dad was a really renowned martial artist family as well, and sort of raised him in that sort of in that sort of way. Was it was it at that point that Menachem sort of realized that man, we're getting much more than just an actor. We're getting this sort of you know a bigger deal at this point. We should we should you know involve him in a you know maybe a more of a leading role. As I told you, I was not involved in the initial step of the movie, of getting the movie. It was uh, Emmett, and the writer was already working. So probably it might have everything that you are mentioning might have happened, but before it was before I I was involved in the movie. When I got involved and I got uh, you know I was given the script, the part of Kane was already in. Uh, the, the basic story was there. I. I I continued to work with uh, Jim Silk, with the writer, but the story, the script was there. Uh, I, I launched right away immediately into storyboard, preparing the action sequences, etc. So uh, it might have been right and, uh, and uh, before I came in. And, but but Shaw had this, uh, you know, the, through, through the filming I saw, he was, uh, he was training his sons. Uh, he was the teacher. He, they didn't have another teacher. He was. Uh, I mean, Offset, probably at home, and they had few dojos, and I, so he was uh, preparing his, uh, not necessarily to be a movie star, but just you know, martial art, you know, in the world of martial art. Uh, le- uh, listen, I, I learned through the years, and you know it, uh, Dustin, I don't have to tell you, this, this uh, martial art is culture, I know it uh, through Steve Lambert, and there is discipline, there is a... Uh, uh, code of honors, etc., and it's uh, passed from the old, from the eldest to the youngest. That that's uh, how martial art work. Uh, Steve Lambert started a very young kid in martial art, and many, I, you know, I get a lot of letters because of Revenge of the Ninja and uh, and, uh, and uh, American Ninja. I get a lot of emails from people uh, which are will be now in the 30s and the 40s, and they tell me we saw the movies uh, when we were kids. Uh, just walked into the neighborhood. We walked. We walked into the neighborhood do, dojo, and we started into martial art. And some of them kept and kept and disciplined. And you know, my friend Isaac Florentine, which is a director, he started the young age, and he's still training every day. I mean, even today, when he's what is he, he's, he's in his sixties, he's still he goes in a competition. And other people that I know, they the same thing. Uh, uh, Brian Genesee. Uh, other people that I know from the world, of course, Tadashi Yamashida, etc. So he said, uh, so that, that's what, probably why he was training his kids, not necessarily to be movie stars, I mean, just martial art. A very dear friend of mine, Mike Vendrell, great, great martial artist, great stuntman, and a, and a great person. One of my best friends. Um, he's passed away now. He originally had this movie. I had no idea this film was going on. He went and met with David Walmark and Sam Furstenberg up in Canon Films when they had a building on Sunset Boulevard, and he got the film. A week later, uh, he had another opportunity to do a TV show called Buck Rogers. You know, he was stuck between a rock and a hard place. What am I going to do? A movie that goes for three months 
or am I going to do a TV show that might go for 10 years? What do you take? Three months of work or 10 years of work? So he took Buck Rogers and he talked to Shmulek and David and said, uh, I got a guy I want you to meet. His name is Steve Lambert. You know, I'm not going to be able to do this show. So he, Shmulek said, okay, bring him. So I went and uh, uh, Mike brought me up there, introduced me, Mike left. We talked for an hour or so and I got the job. And that's how that came about. If it wasn't for Mike Vendrell, I wouldn't have done any of the ninjas because one led to the other. David Womack, who produced uh, One More Chance, was entrusted also by the company to produce The Revenge of the Ninja. Both of us, we didn't know much about uh, Stan, Stan coordinator. So uh, we met uh, Steve Lambert and uh, we learned that he was a martial artist and Shoka, he was introduced to us and Shoka, so we were a team. And Shoka wanted to see uh, what he can do, so we went, to, he took us to uh, one of those dojos, I think, maybe where, where he was training or where Show was training, I don't know. And uh, he showed us his abilities in martial art. And then I, I also spoke with him and I saw that uh, he runs with his imagination. He, he really is creative when it comes to action sequences, etc. I, I introduced him to some of the sequences. I already started to storyboard the, the action, more or less the way it was described in the, in the script, which of course is not enough. You have to work with your stunt, with your choreographer, fight and action choreographer to really develop the... And, and, I, I, and I saw immediately that, that this guy, Steve Lambert, is imaginative, visual, he understands visual, and, and I got the sense that he's brave and crazy. Which I, that, that's what you really need in a stunt coordinator. And that's how we started to work. So he started to work on the action sequences, uh, build them up. Uh, not so much the martial art fights per se, which was the kingdom of Shokasugi. It was the <laughs> but uh, we had enough action, which was not martial art anymore, uh, or some kind of combination and a chase. And uh, I told Steve right away, you don't worry about budgets, please help me to come up with the most imaginative things that you can think that will fit into our means. If we have to fight for everything, leave the fight for me. I will go and fight with the producers. And maybe we'll lose some battles and maybe not everything will be approved <laughs> for execution. But you please come up with the most crazy, imaginative, exciting, compelling stuff that you can think of. And he did, he did, you know, the action sequences are much beyond low action movies, much, much bigger. The, the, the chase sequences, they, they are much, much bigger than your regular low budget movie. You think about life and, and situations that happen. Two weeks before Revenge of the Ninja, uh, I, I had a roommate, uh, a very well-known stuntman, uh, a very close friend of mine, Joel Kramer, who was a stunt double for Arnold Schwarzenegger. So we went on my motorcycle, he was on back, and uh, you know, we, there was, it was the days of no helmets. It was okay to, to not wear a helmet, it was all legal. So he hops on the back of my bike and we go, uh, we go down the street, you know, 50 miles an hour, and, and we're cruising down the street. An old lady in a huge car comes by, runs a, a red light, and I high side it. I see her coming 55 miles an hour and I high side it. I turn it to the side to try to stop it. And, and she goes right through the intersection. And if I didn't high side it, she would have hit me head on. But I, I started going this way and she was going this way. If I would have went this way, try to go straight through, she would have hit me head on. So I decided to turn to the side and I hit her right and we went flying off the bike and i went through the front windshield onto her lap and joel went over the car but his foot his shin hit the top of the roof and she drove about a half a block and stopped because i'm telling her to stop and she had a little kid um in the back she had to be seven eight years old little girl and I finally convinced her to stop and make a long story short 
I broke my, my ankle and I broke my wrist and I got 76 stitches. And Joel uh, got uh, seven bolts in his shin. Uh, broke his shin in two, three places. It's terrible. Yeah, my, my arm hit one side of the, the corner of the, the car and my leg hit the other side and my back, a lot of stitches between my legs, my chest, my arms, all over the place, 76 stitches. But so a couple of days later, I'm, I'm sitting in, in our house and I'm just miserable. I have to call Sam Furstenberg and tell him I can't go to work, I'm hurt. So I call him up and I said, you know, Sam, you got to get somebody else. I'm hurt. You know, this is what happened. And I explained to him what happened. And we say goodbye. You know, a couple hours, I'm heartbroken, I'm depressed. Then he calls me back up and he says, you know, Steve, he said, You're not, we like your ideas so much. Why don't you come and just coordinate? You know, don't do any stunts, just coordinate and come. And I said, okay. And uh, that's what happened. I went there and as I was prepping, a few days went by and I realized what I was putting together and I just, just decided I'll do everything with the opposite leg and the opposite arm and with 76 stitches in me. I had uh, Don Shanks, who was a good friend of mine. So he cut off the, the casts and uh, everything I did in that movie uh, for the next month and a half was with one arm and one leg. In other words, if I had to hold on to something, I would hold on with one arm. I would fake it with the other arm. If I had to, you know, stand up, I would stand up on the good leg. And that's what I went through for with about a month. Yeah. Hey, Cavalier. Cavalier. Four. Five. Yes, Lee. Okay, here's the, what he what he countered with. Uh, the fifty thousand for him is fine. Yes. Two thousand a week for his son is fine, but a guarantee of five weeks. Yes. And show wants his side card. Wants you to get him his side card. If it's in my hands, I will get it. Okay. Yes, if it's it's my hand, of course I'll do my best. Uh, it's my best effort. Okay, then. Uh, so let's let. Time. Yes, five o'clock. Five o'clock, I'll be there. Uh, I want Show to be here to sign. Okay. Bring Show with you. And I've got uh, I've got a paper with some other little contingencies on them, but I don't think any of them are going to be a problem. So uh, I'm I'm paying a minimum of ten to the boy, right? Pardon me. A minimum of ten to the boy. A minimum of ten to the boy. Right? All right, and fifty to him. Fifty to him. And he will sign. And uh, that's what he told me. Fine. Terrific. We sometimes don't understand yeah. why uh, the way the American majors the are producing films, why they cost so much. I mean, we're not limousine people and we are not first class aeroplane and etc. etc. And when we do a movie, we think what's going to be on the screen and not our private leisure and we don't play tennis in the morning and we don't go to Beverly Hills Hotel and sit in the polo lounge, etc. etc. Menachem respected you, and you knew he liked you if he'd work you on the next show. And there were certain guys, certain people that he did that constantly. And part of the creative, as far as Menachem was concerned, you know, even if he didn't know what you were doing, why? Why does it cost this much, right? He enjoyed arguing with you, arguing with his heads, right? for the creativeness of it. And just, just to argue, you know, just, just, to, just to make sure that you know and everybody else knows that he is the presence. And if he has a question, you know, he wants it answered in his way. And I can't tell you how many arguments or discussions he had in Hebrew with guys, I mean, God bless uh, our, our, our special effects makeup man, Moni Manzano, you know, he worked on every picture. And every time Menachem came on the set, there would be a huge argument, you know, because so you gotta understand, as much money as those pictures made, Canon and Menachem, right? The, the people behind the camera, 
the heads who had to get the money to pay for all these things. You know, like I'm talking about the special effects makeup. Menachem would order the production manager delegates all the money to each department, right? You have a million dollars, you give this money to this department, this money to that department. So departments, 90% of the arguments when it came to all the heads of the department was all about money because he wouldn't give you any more money. You know, you want it, you do it, you find a way to do it. Like with me, you know, we're talking about Revenge of the Ninja. You know, people people ask me, how come you decided to do all the parts, all the action on the movie, you know, on Revenge of the Ninja or the Domination or American Ninja? Well, if I didn't do the parts, or the, the stunt doubling or the stunts, it wouldn't be in the movie because he only gave me a certain amount of money. I didn't have, and that certain amount of money, I had to make sure it was spread out throughout the movie, the things I needed, the man days, you know, uh, the equipment. So you had to delegate that money. So 90% of the arguments with all the heads when Menachem came on was all about money all about money you know he wanted you to be creative with the money you had it's like like i was saying with me you know i had all this action i mean we're talking about revenge of the ninja all the action we had in there i didn't have enough money to, to put it on screen you had thirty-eight thousand dollars, right wasn't it 38 mm -hmm. wasn't it thirty-eight thousand yeah. dollars that you had yeah. to play with i mean that's amazing considering what you did yeah so so I had no choice. You know, I always say uh, there was two sides to that. You know, the no money side where I had no choice. And the second side was I was happy because I had no choice and I got to do it. So I, I was perfectly happy in my situation. But when you talk about props or makeup, that's a whole different story. You know, they can't, you know, it's a different department. So if I wanted, you know, uh, a stunt in the movie, in Revenge of the Ninja, you know, I had to either uh, spend some of the money I had and get it and miss something else in the movie, take away something else in the movie or do it myself. So I was perfectly happy doing it myself. And uh, I knew that it was gonna come out above and beyond what I needed because I tried people a couple of times and it just didn't do it for me. You know, I couldn't, uh, Revenge of the Ninja, I couldn't bring back people because I didn't have $38,000 in a movie that had as much action as that was nothing, it was nothing. David was clever enough, myself, and we had enough cleverness to fight with the office, with the front office about to, to get more money and more budget for this, for that. And, uh, and listen, we ended up uh, shooting nine weeks, six days. That's not typical for low budget. Low budget, the, the maximum is six weeks. <laughs> and, and we got uh, nine weeks to shoot uh, the movie and it shows, you know. You, the magnitude, the, the, the grandness of the action, the, the end fight on the roof, uh, things like this, you can see. And every, everything like this takes four, five, six days. The, the action on the roof is one week of work. And, and he kept coming with ideas, Steve, Steve Lambert. Then I learned during the filming how brave he is. He's a very brave stuntman, very, very. Uh, we did the uh, slide for life cross between two buildings, no safety net. No, no. And, and I'm thinking about it today when I'm 17 years, I said, we were so stupid when we were young. Security was zero, you know, safety, we, we were so unsafe. So how did we do stuff like this? Crossing between two buildings, 17 stories, I don't know, 20, with no safety net, with no harness, with things like that that I couldn't believe, you know, with, with the driving car and he's flipping over and going through the glass, to the front glass. But Steve is very brave and imaginative. He comes up with ideas, he comes up with interesting sequences of uh, action. 
And so even during production, not only pre-production, during production, he always came up with more and let's do this and let's say, can we do this and let's add and let's add this little bit, bit of excitement and another, another punch, another uh, things that many times are not in the script. There is a sequence that somebody is drag, dragged down the stairs and his chin goes, you know, hits every stair. So that's something you don't, it's not a script, not an hour. In a big budget movie, in a huge budget studio movie, it can be, maybe it was scripted. And then, but because we saw the stairs and Steve comes and says, let me do this. What do you need? I just need a little sponge on the edge of every, <laughs> and, and I will teach the stuntmen how to do it. Uh, and, and they will do it. And, and so things like this comes, they, they, they come to life when we see the location. We seize the opportunity of, of the topography and wow, let's do something. I truly believe, if I remember, that the idea came from Shokasugi, but you see this kind of fight in every uh, Hong Kong movie. The tower was in the script. From what we did on the streets and then the lead up, eventually going up to the tower. That was something Sam and I and Shokazuki as a team worked our way as we were going. It's not like the big studio movies, which is a profit sharing. There is no profit sharing in the world of independence.